maybe your spouse said to you, uh, hey, honey, can we talk? Or, and I know this happens so commonly, maybe you need to confront your neighbor about their cat who keeps coming on your patio and doing his business on your patio furniture. Oh, wait a minute, that's me. That's a conversation that still needs to happen. I don't know who the cat belongs to. (laughs) Or there already would have been a chat about the cat. But there has not been one yet. Anyway, most of us would prefer to have our toenails ripped out by one at a time by rusty pliers rather than have a confrontation with somebody or to confront somebody. We hate confrontation. Am I right? How many of you would say we hate confrontation? Yes, most people do. Now, there is a certain personality type that loves it, but mostly people don't really like confrontation. Will you be ready for your next confrontation? Does the Bible have anything to say about successful confrontation? Does, uh, how does God confront people? And is there any upside to confrontation? Is there anything good that comes out of it? Well, it's, it's a regular part of life, so we better look at it, especially look at what God says about it. We've been in a series called Courageous Faith. And we've been looking in, in the Bible in the chapter of, of Hebrews, 11th chapter of Hebrews, at a list of Bible heroes that have demonstrated faith in some way, courageous faith. And we've been looking at their lives, trying to see what could we learn from them, how could we be inspired by them, how could we be corrected or challenged by them. And today I want to talk to you about courageous conversations, courageous conversations, and that is when you have to have faith and courage to have a certain kind of conversation with someone or to endure one. In Hebrews eleven twenty three, towards we're getting towards the end of the chapter, not quite there yet, but towards the end, it says, it would take too long to recount the stories of the faith of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and all the prophets. And, and he, he's been going through this chapter just talking about the faith of various Bible heroes. But he said, there are so many people who have exercised faith. It would take too long to even, even just tell it all. But today, we do have some time, and we're going to zero in on one of those names in particular, and that is Samuel. Samuel. He was a prophet, and he was Israel's final judge. If you've been uh, hearing the messages recently, you know we've been talking about some of the judges of Israel. They were regional or national leaders that God raised up to deliver his people, Israel, from their enemies. And so Samuel is really kind of a bridge. He's, he's the last one that we would call probably a judge uh, right before the, era, the, the time period of the kings came. Okay, so Samuel is just right there on the end of the judges. And one day, Samuel walked up to Saul, who was the first king of Israel, and Samuel said, Stop! Listen to what the Lord told me last night. Gutsy. Can you imagine walking up to the president or the queen or just someone in royalty and just saying, stop, quit talking. This is what you're doing. This is what I want you to do. Listen, God told me something. I want to tell you about it. And then he didn't stop with that phrase. He let King Saul have it. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me back up a little bit. Let's just talk about Samuel a little bit first. Samuel was an answer to prayer for his mother. His mother, Hannah, was unable to have children, and she was crying out to the Lord, and and she was just praying, God, give me a son. And, And she said, Lord, she made a vow. If you give me a son, even though it seems to be impossible physically, if you give me a son, I will give him back to you. And it just reminds me of of this Bible truth that God's gifts are meant to be re-gifted. God's gifts are meant to be re-gifted. So many times we're praying for something to receive something, and God is happy to give. God is generous. He is a blessing uh, giver. But most of the time, his blessing is to flow through you to others, to bless others. And that was the case here. Hannah got that. She said, if you give me a son, I will give him right back to you, Lord. 
And she said, as a sign that he's been consecrated to the Lord. Does that word sound familiar? If you were here last week, it might sound familiar. As a sign that the son that I'm praying for, if you give him to me, as a sign that he'll be consecrated to you, dedicated to you, set apart to you, his hair will never be cut. We always talk about Samson and his hair, but Samuel also did not cut his hair. He was a Nazarite from birth. It was a vow that his mom, Hannah, took. And we see and we know that God anoints the consecrated. God anoints the consecrated. I talked about this quite a bit last week when we were talking about Samson. What is the anointing? The anointing is the power of the Holy Spirit that comes on you to accomplish something in the lives of others. The anointing is not so much to make you feel close to God. God's presence does make us feel close to God. But the anointing, when we use that word, the anointing, we're talking about an empowerment, an endowment from God and from his Holy Spirit to go accomplish something in the lives of his people. We've been looking at the judges in the, in, in the Old Testament times, in, the, in you know, ancient Israel. They were anointed to deliver their, God's people from their enemies. It was an anointing to do something. And an anointing was an empowerment to accomplish something that could not be accomplished in the natural realm. But Samuel was also anointed, not just Sam's son, but Samuel. And he was a prophet that he was anointed. I noticed this. And I don't think I've really thought about this before, but this week as I was preparing, I noticed Samuel seemed to be anointed to have courageous conversations. Many, many of the stories, in fact, one of the earliest stories, I don't have time to get, them, get into all of them, but one of the earliest stories of, of his childhood was a confrontation where God told Samuel, I'm anointing you to have a courageous conversation, a tough conversation, conversation no one wanted to have. But Samuel had to grow in his anointing. He lived in the tent of worship, and I don't know if we hear this detail about anybody else like this, but he was assisting Eli, the Jewish high priest, and the Bible says that he slept near the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of God. Wow, that, that's pretty intense. This was before the big Jewish temple was built, and it was a, it was a portable um, uh, tabernacle. In 1 Samuel chapter 2, and that's where we see the, the full story of Samuel in, in the book named after him. 1 Samuel 2.21, it says, Samuel grew up in the presence of the Lord. Samuel grew up in the presence of the Lord. That is an amazing thing that God would say about him. And he literally grew up in the church. Back then, it was the, the portable house of worship, the tent of worship. So I'm going to jump over to 1 Samuel 15. If you want to find that in your Bible or on your, your, your device, uh, we'll be staying in 1 Samuel 15 for quite a while. So I'm going to start right at the very beginning of that chapter. One day, Samuel said to Saul, so he's talking to the king, it was the Lord who told me to anoint you. Ah, there's that word again. The Lord told me to anoint you as king of his people, Israel. Now remember, this is the first king. Israel had never had a king before. But the people cried out and said, we want a king, we want a king. And so God led Samuel to anoint Saul. Now listen to this message from the Lord. So Samuel's reminding him, you would not even be king if God had not chosen and I had not anointed you in obedience to the Lord. So Samuel's trying to get Saul's attention. Hey, king, your kingship come from, comes from God. And he has a message for the king. This is what the Lord of heaven's armies has declared. I have decided, decided to settle accounts with the nation of Amalek for opposing Israel when they came from Egypt. So God was leading his people on a spiritual journey, and this, this, this country of people opposed them. Verse 3, now go. So this is God speaking through the prophet Samuel to King Saul. Now go 
and completely destroy the entire Amalekite nation. Men, women, children, babies, cattle, sheep, goats, camels, and donkeys. This is serious judgment from the Lord. Now, I, I want you to know they have had three centuries to repent. And they have not done it. They have been a murderous, hostile nation. And God said, your number is up, Amalek, and you are done. Judgment is coming to you. And it just reminds me of a verse I read earlier today in this service during communion. The wages of sin is what? Death. The wages of sin is death. That is a principle that God has put into the universe. The wages, the payment for sin, the payback for sin is death. Sin is missing the mark of God's standard. It is living for yourself instead of living for God. And so Saul, King Saul heard this word from the Lord, and he and his army went to battle. Now remember, uh, we, we kind of miss this word because we're not reading the original language of Hebrew, but the word here is consecrate this uh, country, Amalek, to the Lord by completely destroying it. Set this apart to God by completely destroying it. It's the other way of consecration. And it is complete and utter destruction uh, for the Lord in obedience to the Lord. So, he, so Saul went and he killed the Amalekite people, but, somebody say but. Oh, that gets us in trouble. But he spared the Amalekite king, King Agag, and he spared the best of their livestock. Do you remember the command? The command of God was very clear. So I'm going to skip down to verse 10. Then the Lord said to Samuel, this, the prophet, the judge, the Lord said, I am sorry that I ever made Saul king, for he has not been loyal to me and has refused to obey my command. Samuel was so deeply moved by this conversation with God when he heard this that he cried out to the Lord all night. Church, we today have access to the Holy Spirit 24-7. God is in you. He is with you. And I just got to ask me, I've got to ask you, when's the last time you cried out to the Lord all night about anything? We, we struggle so much just to talk with the Lord and to hear the voice of the Lord. Perhaps the issue is our consecration. God's really been talking to me over and over and over in my life. Things I've been listening to, things I've been hearing, things I'm reading in the Bible, sermons I'm preparing about consecration. I want to be consecrated to God. And God's been putting his finger on some places in my life that are not set apart to God. They are not consecrated to God. I'm not 100% consecrated to God, but I want to be. I want the anointing of God on me so powerful that I'm able to accomplish things in the spirit that I could not accomplish in the natural. I am praying for some specific anointings of God on my life. But can you imagine, and I just want to whet your appetite. I want to make you hungry. I want to make you thirsty for the kind of conversation that you have with God that God would tell you how he feels. Do you, do you hear this language? I'm sorry that I ever made Saul king. Wow. We learn from this passage a couple things about God. We learn that God highly values obedience. God said, I'm sorry I made him king because he did not obey me. God really values obedience. So what you do in uh, matters what you leave undone matters to God. Your obedience matters to God. There were a couple times earlier in the service today where I did not know, Lord, is this you talking? I, I just didn't want to take any chance. If it was God, I wanted to make sure I just stepped out, even on the littlest thing, because I want him to be able to speak to me about bigger things. What you do matters to God, and it affects your relationship with God. 
Are you obeying what you know God's calling you to do? We also learn in this passage that God has feelings. I don't know what your picture is of God, but God is personal. He's real. He's dynamic. He gets sad. He gets mad. He laughs. He sings. God rejoices. God has feelings, and a lot of times I think we, we can say, oh, God probably doesn't have feelings. That seems so human. Do you know why humans have feelings? Because God does. He had them first, and then he made you and me in his image. That's why we have feelings, because God has feelings, and he's our creator. Samuel was so close to God that when God hurt, Samuel hurt. Wow. The word here, when God says, I was sorry, he's saying, I am pained. This is painful for me. It's a different word than sorrow. He said, this is painful to me that I made Saul king. So many times when you or I get upset or mad, it's because we've been hurt, we're offended, we're slighted. But I want to be so close to God that when he's upset, I'm upset for him. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done. It's about you, Lord. It really is not even about me. I'm in your kingdom. I serve at the pleasure of the King of kings, almighty God. Well, Samuel went out to find King Saul. He, he just was crying out to God all night. He's so upset that God's upset. God said his kingship is over. So Samuel goes out to find him. Let's, let's skip down to verse 13. When Samuel finally found him, Saul greeted him cheerfully. You guys, you can immediately see what he's doing. May the Lord bless you, Saul said. I've carried out the Lord's command. Verse 14, then what is the, all the bleeding, bleating of sheep and goats and the lowing of cattle that I hear, Samuel demanded. Saul immediately turns on the spin cycle. You know what spin is? That's when you take certain uh, events and you put your meaning on them, your perspective, to soften them or to make them more like in your favor, in your light. If you've ever watched a presidential speech, a lot of times, like at the State of the Union, afterwards there'll be a Democrat and a Republican that both give their spin on what was just said. And it, it's the spin room. That's what the media calls it. It's the spin room. They're just saying, this is what we think it means, you know, in my favor to make me look good. That's what Saul did. Saul, Saul says, yes, I did obey the Lord. I, I saved the best of the livestock to sacrifice to the Lord in worship. But we destroyed everything else. And now we're back to where we started this message earlier today. We're going to see some biblical principles for courageous conversations. Verse 16, then Samuel said to Saul, stop! This is what you're doing. You need to do this. Listen to what the Lord told me last night. And we know that God speaks the hard things through people. So my first challenge to you today is, so let God use you. Let God speak through you. There may be someone in your life that needs to hear a word of correction from the Lord. When you hold back, when you know God has something to say through you, someone in your life loses an opportunity to grow and especially to grow closer to God. Ephesians 4.15 gives us some guidance. Instead, we will speak the truth in love. And it's not very loving if you don't speak the truth. And it's not very truthful if all of it is is lovey-dovey. Growing in every way more and more like Christ. We speak the truth in love. That's how we speak. So Samuel says, listen to what the Lord told me last night. Verse 16 at the end, what did he tell you, Saul asked. Verse 17, and Samuel told him, although you may think a little of yourself, we know that because we've seen Saul uh, demonstrate his insecurities many times. I don't have time to go into all the stories today. He, Samuel said, although you may think little of yourself, are you not the leader of the tribes of Israel? The Lord has anointed you king of Israel. And here's just a principle I see about uh, uh, challenging conversations, courageous conversations. First of all, build bridges of encouragement. That's a great way to start, a, a, great, a great way. Build bridges of encouragement. Look for something positive that you can say. 
because you want, you want the person in your life to know you love them, you care about them. You're, you're not there just to smack them down. So he starts by saying, you are the leader. Don't, I, I knew you may not think of yourself as much, but God thinks of you as the leader of his people. Verse 18, and the Lord sent you on a mission and told you, go and completely destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, until they are all dead. So here's a second principle, very good for confrontation. Review the expectations. Review the expectations and the agreement. Facts actually speak very loudly. It's a lot, uh, it's a lot better to, to not say something like, I just think you're selfish, I just think you're... No, just say, this is what we agreed on, this is what you did. That's the facts. No emotion on it. So then he asks this poignant question in the next verse, why haven't you obeyed the Lord? Why did you rush for the plunder and do what was evil in the Lord's sight? Now, here is a very good principle for us. Samuel is in a little different situation, and I'll point that out in just a second. But if you are trying to understand what happened, it's better to ask what and how questions. I cannot tell you how many times I have jumped to conclusions and thought, so-and-so was selfish, so-and-so was hurtful, so-and-so was this, was that, only to find out I didn't really know the picture. So it is really better to ask questions first. But I encourage you to not do what Samuel did in this place. Don't say why. Why immediately puts the other person in battle mode, defensive mode. But like I say, he was in a little different situation here, and we'll get to that. And the last principle here, hold people accountable for their actions. Hold people accountable for their actions, especially if you had an agreement or uh, a standard that was agreed to was, and it was not met. You got to hold people accountable. Now, Samuel, he didn't really need to say a lot of fluffy, nice things. He didn't really need to say a lot of uh, bridge building. He didn't really need to come up with a performance plan because he already had a revelation from God. And so he was about to communicate God's judgment. So he is in a little different place. He, he, he was asking, what, what's your motive? Like, why did you not obey completely what God said to do? So we kind of, we've been looking a little bit about confronting. But let's flip it, and let's look at being confronted. So what did Saul do? He immediately starts making excuses. He said, I totally obeyed. I carried out the Lord's mission. I just brought back one little king and some nice cattle. The Bible actually says it was all the best livestock, is what it says. And then he blamed the troops for keeping the prime livestock. And he said to Samuel the prophet, he said, I, we only kept them to sacrifice to the Lord your God. And that is Saul's problem. It should have been the Lord his God. He is a member of God's people. In fact, he was the leader of God's people. Of anybody that should know God, it should have been Saul, King Saul. And that really got him into trouble. And so then he did not take it seriously when Samuel's God said, you got to go do this thing. Kill everybody because he wasn't his God. He was not serving him. Even though God had come on him powerfully and had anointed Paul, Saul to do very amazing things, Saul's heart was not consecrated to the Lord. And he's about to lose the anointing. So here's, here's kind of the flip side. God speaks the hard things through people, like I already said. But so when someone confronts you, here's a couple of things to do. When you're the one being confronted, first of all, ask the Holy Spirit what he wants to, to say to you through this. It is so easy to get defensive. It's so easy to make excuses. It's so easy to not own it. But if you instead would just close your mouth, listen, and pray, Holy Spirit, what do you want to teach me right now? What do you want to say to me? My heart is open, and I am listening. Speak, Holy Spirit. And I want you to know, God is pretty famous for speaking through the unlikely people. One time he spoke through a donkey. He spoke through a donkey, a human voice 
came out of that donkey because God said, I am getting your attention. God might speak through your spouse. You might think your spouse is a spiritual giant or lesser than you. God, uh, God might speak through your kids. God might speak through your boss, your teacher, your coworker, your neighbor. God might speak to you through any number of people that you would not have picked. He may speak to you through someone you don't currently respect. That's how God works sometimes. Because he wants it to be about him, not the vessel, not who's going through. So ask the Holy Spirit, what's he speaking to you? God might even speak to you through your pastor sometime. Maybe it could happen. I don't know. I pray that it would. But remember, when God speaks through a person, they're only human. They might do a really crummy job of communicating. But if you are in a posture of saying, Holy Spirit, what are you saying? I'm going to look beyond their roughness. I'm going to look beyond their stutter. I'm going to look beyond it to say, what are you saying to me through this? Because I don't want to miss out on what you're saying. So many times we miss out on the message because we get stuck on the messenger. Here's a second principle. Don't make excuses. Make amends. Don't make excuses. Make amends. Make it right if there's any way possible. If you did it wrong, own it. I heard a message several years ago that just impacted me so much, and I have just incorporated this into my prayer. When I go to the Lord and I say, Lord, I did this wrong thing. Please forgive me. I have just been challenged, and I've been, I've been saying this. I own it. I cannot blame it on my friends. I cannot blame it on the economy. I cannot blame it on any other thing or any other person. I made a choice. I was wrong. I own it. And there is something powerful there that happens when you own it. 1 John 1, 9 talks about owning it. If you did wrong, own it. Confess it. I did this. No one made me do this. There may have been pressure, but I chose. I own it. Confess it. Repent. Repent means turn, it, turn the other away from that wrong. Make it right if possible. What would have happened if King Saul had repented and worked with Samuel to make amends? I don't know. There are other times in the Bible where God decreed judgment and people repented and he said, okay, I see that. I'm not going to kill this whole city. What would have happened if Saul would have said, you are right, I am wrong, I own it, I knew it was all, I spared people, I did wrong. Samuel, would you work with me? And let's make it right. I confess in front of all these people, I confess. What would have happened? It would have changed the course of history. Perhaps he and his family would have gone on, and his, his line would have lasted. I don't know. In verse 16, Samuel has one of the most memorable, courageous conversations in the Bible. Okay, it's already it's been like in your face, intense, but he's about to go up even another notch. Actually, in verse, uh, verse 22, I'm sorry, verse 22. What is more pleasing to the Lord? Your burnt offerings and sacrifices or your obedience to his voice. Because remember, Saul said, I know I didn't kill all the livestock, but I, was, I decided instead of obeying, I was going to sacrifice them to the Lord your God. And Samuel says, what's more pleasing to the Lord? Your burnt offerings and sacrifices or your obedience to his voice? Listen, obedience is better than sacrifice. The King James translation says, to obey is better than than sacrifice. And there, there's an old Keith Green song. That is my era, man. Keith Green song. To obey is better than sacrifice. I want hearts of fire, not your prayers of ice. And I'm coming quickly to give back to you according to what you have done. According to what you have done. According to what you have done. To obey God is better than sacrifice. That's what God wants. He says, submission to God is better than offering the fat of rams on a sacrifice fire. Rebellion, in other words, disobeying the Lord. A lot of times we think rebellion, oh, that's when you go out and you start a riot or, or something like that. No, rebellion in this context is disobeying the Lord. Rebellion is as sinful as witchcraft. 
disobeying the Lord is as sinful as witchcraft. In other words, cooperating with the enemy, cooperating with the devil, with Satan. And stubbornness is as bad as worshiping idols. So when you're saying, God, no, God, I'm going to do it my way. I know what you're calling to me. I am not doing that. I am doing this other thing. God says that is as bad as worshiping idols because you're making an idol of that thing or yourself. So he, because you have rejected the command of the Lord, King Saul, he has rejected you as king. Even in this confrontation, Samuel, or Saul had an opportunity to repent. He may have still lost the kingdom. I don't know. But he had an opportunity to repent. He still didn't do it even with this in-your-face confrontation from the prophet. So he said, you are done as king. And then, catch this, Samuel, the pastor, says, bring me King Ahab, Agag, the Amalekite king. Bring him to me. And he says to the king, King Agag, this, this foreign hostile king, he says, you have made many mothers childless because your sword has killed their sons. Right now, your mom is going to be childless because I'm killing you. He takes out his sword, and he completes the work that God called Saul to do, and he, he slices him up. The prophet. This is not a warrior. This is a prophet, because he realized how critical it was that we obey God. And I love the way it says in verse 33, Samuel cut Agag to pieces before the Lord at Gilgal, this, this place of worship. In verse 35, I, I just want to clarify, Samuel wasn't just mean. He was holy. He was consecrated. He was dedicated to the Lord and had a passion for the Lord. Verse 35, Samuel never went to meet with Saul again, but he mourned constantly for him. To the point, at one point, God had to say, okay, knock it off. Enough, enough mourning. Like, Samuel was so deeply grieved that this anointed king fell. And I believe that's a picture of, of God's heart for us. He does not want us to fall in disobedience. The bottom line of this message is that God often speaks through courageous conversations. God often speaks through courageous conversations. So would you stand your feet? Let's pray as we conclude this time together. If you're online, would you make where you are a place of prayer? Let's participate. Don't watch me pray. Let's pray together. Would you all bow your heads? And let's pray to the living God, the God who knows you, the God who knows what you did last night, the God who knows what you're thinking right now, the God who knows you. Let's pray to him right now. Lord, I pray that you would help us to learn from Saul's mistake. You had it written down so we would learn, so we would know what you want, what you expect. And Lord, we want to be in a place of anointing. I want to be in a place of consecration. So I pray, Lord, first of all, that you would help us to hear your voice. Lord, excuse me, most of us here, we're reading through the Bible during the week on our own. Lord, I pray that we would hear your voice when we read your word. As we're going through the book of John right now as a church, Lord, I pray you would speak to us about Jesus, this one who is the bread of life. Lord, speak to us about him. Help us to know you. Help us to hear you. Help us to understand that the commands you give are commands for us too. And help us to obey your voice. So help us hear your voice. Help us to obey your voice, Lord. Lord, I pray that you would speak to us through your Holy Spirit, through your word, through another person, maybe even a surprising person, but help us to hear your voice in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray you'd help us to look past the messenger and hear from you. Lord, I pray you'd help us to own the things that own our disobedience, own the things we've done wrong, own, own those commands we've disobeyed, own our apathy. Help us, Lord, to own our inaction, our inactivity for you. Help us to own it, repent, and follow you wholeheartedly, Lord God. We consecrate ourselves, we set ourselves apart for you in Jesus' name. And with your head still bowed, I want to invite you to put your faith in Jesus. Maybe you've never done that, and that's really the first act of consecration that God would ask of you right now, is to put your faith in Jesus, to do that, uh, uh, that repenting that I talked about Saul could have done. How do you repent? How do you put your faith in Jesus? Turn away from your sins. Turn your life over to Jesus. Say, I'm giving you me. I surrender me to you, Lord. 
and let him lead you. And I want, I want you to know, I'm not calling you to an easy thing. This is not a quick decision in, a, in the middle of a service. This is a life change where you say, okay, I am no longer calling the shots, but I give that authority to you, Lord Jesus. You come and lead me. It's hard. God's going to slowly put some things, uh, his finger on some things in your life. He's going to say, you've got to drop that off, man. That thing's hurting you. You've got to drop that off. That thing is binding you. You've got to drop it off. But the Holy Spirit's going to do that in his good time. So I'm not calling you to an easy thing. I'm calling you to follow Jesus. I'm calling you to be a disciple, to take up your cross and follow Jesus. Take up your cross and follow him. He, he died on the cross of salvation. You've got to take up your cross of crucifying your flesh, of saying no to self, taking self off the throne and putting Jesus on the throne. It, I know, I'm being intense. I just feel the Holy Spirit just saying that through me. Rise up and call you to follow Jesus for real. And if today is your day to put your faith in Jesus, you want to become a Christian today, would you just raise your hand right now? And, and that will be a signal to me that, to let me know you're making that decision. And I want to pray for you. Online, I can't see your hands raised, but God can. And I encourage you to physically raise your hand to God if you're putting your faith in Jesus today. And let's follow him. I'd love to just coach you in a prayer. And if you're praying this prayer today, would you pray it out loud to God? Here we go, out loud. Jesus, I invite you into my life. I acknowledge I'm a sinner. Please forgive me of my sin and make me new. I choose to follow you starting now. In Jesus' name, amen. And we just want to say welcome to the family of God. Welcome to the kingdom of God. If you put your faith in Jesus, would you please just let me know. Fill it out, a connect card. Check the box on it that says I made this decision. Check that box and turn it into an usher so that I can know and pray for you and cheer you on. All right, God bless you. Amen. Thanks, Pastor Garen. I want to be able to have courageous faith conversations like that, like Samuel. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, at this time, the ushers are going to be coming down the aisle to collect those Connect cards. If you haven't filled them out, now is the time. And um, it was so good to see you all this week. We'll see you next week. Stay cool out there. We love you guys. God bless.